I'd like to thank the organisers for what's been a very successful conference, although I've just arrived. We have been following the conference and I know that it has been uh, being well received. Um, and certainly the speakers have been very powerful um, on this uh, crucial issue. Um, I just wanted to touch, uh, uh, previous speakers commented about um, hoping that the UK government would step up uh, and uh, have a robust anti-slap law. And in fact, in May this year, the UK did step up its monitoring of slaps after we were identified as a slap-friendly jurisdiction um, owing in the most part to libel tourism and specialist media law firms. The Russian invasion of Ukraine made this monitoring all the more urgent, with allies of Putin funding litigation against the UK public interest. As you know all too well, uh, the landscape in which journalists operate, both in the UK and across the world, is becoming increasingly hostile. Slaps are just one of a vast arsenal of threats that a free press and free speech campaigners are having to contend with. And freedom of speech is the cornerstone of our democracy. So the erosion of media freedom and the increase in abuse and violence faced by journalists globally has grave implications for human rights, public participation and democratic accountability. In that climate, making sure our legal system robustly defends transparency and free speech couldn't be more important. In 2021, we launched a national action plan for the safety of journalists to stop journalists from being physically harmed, harassed and intimidated. Its aim is to increase awareness of the safety challenges faced by journalists in the UK, introduce measures to tackle uh, them and bring those accountable to justice. We also established a media freedom coalition with our campaign partners, Canada, and in July 2019, um, we saw that coalition come to fruition. And this is a strong partnership of countries working together to advocate for media freedom and the safety of journalists, and to hold account those who harm journalists simply for doing their job. The media freedom coalition continues to expand, and we currently have 50 members, all pledging to improve media freedom at home and abroad broad. And that gives you a sense of what we're doing to protect media freedoms and address the wider issues surrounding slaps. Now, I want to turn to the road ahead and focus on the theme of this conference, Spotlighting Solutions. As many of the panels of the past two days have already discussed, the UK aims to introduce comprehensive and targeted anti-slap legislation. The government ran a public call for evidence on slaps in March this year, uh, just three weeks after the Russian invasion of Ukraine started. Uh, this helped us to get a grip on the scale of the issue. Some of what it uncovered was nothing short of harrowing, laying bare the financial and psychological impact that extensive litigation has on slaps defendants. And I'm grateful to everyone who has shared their views, shared their lived experiences and testimonies as these have formed a solid basis for our targeted anti-slap reforms. We intend to turn our planned reforms into reality as soon as parliamentary time allows. And if I may um, depart from some of the script that my officials always give me, and I'm notorious for kind of winding up my officials for going slightly off pitch, it's often, you know, ministers often say as soon as parliamentary time allows, and that's often seen as basically, yeah, just bear with us and it will eventually get round to it. I can tell you that the commitment to legislate is as firm as it gets. There are ongoing discussions about how we get this legislation into Parliament and then onto the statute books. So I just wanted to go a little bit further than just the usual catchphrase that ministers have of as soon as parliamentary time allows. The commitment is absolutely solid. Because introducing the national anti-slap legislation is uncharted territory. So it is important that we get this right to avoid having to rectify and unpick our legislation at a later stage. If it's too hasty, we risk tackling only some parts of the problem that can then be circumvented by other means, effectively creating loopholes in the system, given the complexity of slaps. We know that defendants are intimidated by the prospect of years of expensive litigation. Indeed, we've heard poignant testimonies about this throughout the course of the conference. So to give our courts more powers to stop this, we plan to introduce an early dismissal process in statute, which will effectively stop claimants from financially and psychologically exhausting their opponents, cutting short cases which have no merit with the use of a three-part test. 
First, the claim will need to be in the public interest. Second, the claim needs to have some features of an abusive process. We will set out these features in an illustrative, non-exhaustive list of factors that are common hallmarks of SLAPS litigation. And finally, the claim needs to lack sufficient evidence of merit to proceed. The crippling costs borne by SLAPS descendants can sometimes total millions of pounds, and we'll address these costs through a new cost protection scheme, which will make sure that journalists and free speech advocates can litigate without fear of bankruptcy. This scheme will be introduced in secondary legislation once the essential identifying features are set out in statute. Beyond legislation, we're working closely with the Solicitors Regulation Authority, who should be applauded for their recent action on SLAPS. They are currently carrying out a thematic review of over 20 firms suspected of involvement in SLAP activity. This means a deep dive into conduct that may breach ethical or regulatory duties, showing that our regulatory system is adapting at pace to these novel challenges. And I welcome the warning notice that the SRA issued yesterday and that they continue to provide guidance on conduct in disputes. The UK legal system has a world-class reputation. Our legal services sector contributed over 29.6 billion gross value added to the economy and generated revenue of over 36 billion in 2019 alone. It's one of our greatest exports. So it would be a pity if that reputation were to be damaged by a few bad apples. The SRA's decisive action supports the wider cultural shift in the UK, away from tolerating activity that tarnishes the integrity of our judicial and legal profession. So to eradicate slaps on the global stage, we need to come together as an international community. During this conference, we've heard about anti-slap legislation from a global perspective. It's imperative to learn from jurisdictions that have already introduced anti-slap legislation and other initiatives such as Canada and the United States. To that end, the UK continues to work closely with our international partners, including the EU, the Council of Europe and the Organisation for Security and Cooperation's representative on freedom of the media. We must stand together to oppose autocratic and divisive approaches to journalistic freedom. And I remain committed to tackling SLAPs comprehensively. And I welcome initiatives such as this conference that keeps SLAPs high on the agenda and builds momentum across governments on the international stage. And these initiatives would be impossible without the incredibly hard work of our civil society who advocate time and time again on the issue of slaps. And just last week, the UK anti-slap coalition launched its model anti-slap laws we've heard. A stellar example of how civil society and government can align their thinking to maximise impact. Article 19 continues its diligent reporting on slap suits across Europe exposing what claimants hope to hide. In October, a UK government representative spoke at the European Anti-SLAP Conference on a panel discussing national approaches to anti-SLAP legislation, sharing ideas to increase international join-up. I look forward to continuing the fruitful collaboration with all our civil society stakeholders on this critical issue. So to close, I want to thank everyone again for their involvement in this past two days, and for those who have tirelessly campaigned against the abuse of the legal system. It underscores civil society's unwavering support for journalists who uncover wrongdoing, and the deep importance you all place on freedom of speech, truly the backbone of any democracy. And my last comment is, the messages that you have sent today have been very firmly heard in government, and we will be acting. Thank you.